Good morning, Caroline. It's nice to see you. YouTube audio test, one, two, one, two. Sounds good, Melody. There's Matt Luloff in the studio, Indeed. Studio 54. <laughs> Wow, I'm getting gray. Just notice that. It's the harsh lights, you know. <laughs> I can recommend my hairdresser. That's a problem. <laughs> not, not, the, not for the next 28 days. <laughs> <laughs> so I got, I, my last haircut was at the Carlingwood uh, Barber Shop with Tony. Oh, I know him. Because Gus is normally there, but he's been away since the pandemic. I think oh. they said Alex gets his hair cut there. He does. And I think Bob Shirelli does too. And at yep. one point, Larry O'Brien told me he went there. So <laughs> they've had three mayors. <laughs> does he have any hair to cut? <laughs> Shave. <laughs> We're a few minutes early. Let's see what else is there. How was your weekend, uh, Jenna? I see you there. It was great, thank you. You look tanned. I was outside a lot. <laughs> wearing sunglasses. I was, can you tell? <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> My kids have already made fun of me. <laughs> Hi, Carol Ann. Hey, Carol Ann's on mute. I see Jean smiling and George. Morning, everyone. How's that maple syrup coming, George? Very good. They're still yeah. running, actually, a little bit. Yeah, it's been good weather for it. Yeah. We did the 30 liter this year, so we're good. Oh, good. There's Laura. Let's see. I see Councillor Hubley up there. So we're just we're just a few minutes uh, early, so we'll just start in a minute. Morning, Mr. Mayor. Hey, Alan, how are you? Doing great. Just checking with bylaw to see if they've got the students hired yet. <laughs> Get uh, <with> their badges. <clears throat> the how was your Easter weekend, weekend, weekend in Canada? Fantastic. Uh, beautiful weekend for walking the trails and a lot of people were out there and getting their exercise, physically distancing. I guess Eva James would have been busy on the weekend. It was. I, I drove by on uh, Sunday and uh, as usual, the lot was full, but you just see a steady movement of people in and out. So it's uh, they're doing a great job of uh, managing that site. That's good. So Carol, are we all set with uh, technology? You can let whoever in in. We we are, Mr. Mayor. We're live, and you do have quorum. Okay. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, bonjour, mesdames et messieurs. Welcome to the Finance and Economic Development Committee meeting for the sixth of April, twenty twenty one. Bienvenue à la Comité des Finances et de Développement Économique pour le six avril vingt vingt et un. Uh, do we have quorum, Madam Coordinator? Yes, we do, Mr. Mayor. Okay, a few reminders for today's meeting, uh, which is being held using Zoom. Members of committee and staff, please stay on mute at all times unless called upon to speak. And members of council, if you wish to speak to an item, please use the raised hand feature located at the bottom of the participants list in uh, Zoom or star nine for members on the phone. And the meeting will be live streamed on YouTube and members and staff are asked to position their cameras so that their faces are centered and as close to the top of the frame as possible. And phone in participants, please do not put your phone on hold. So before we uh, proceed, I'll do a quick roll call of all members. Councillor Cloutier. Yeah. Councillor Daroons. I'm here, Mr. Mayor. Councillor El Shantiri. Present. Councillor Gower. Here. Councillor Harder. Here. Councillor Hubley. Here. Councillor Luloff. Good morning. Councillor Moffat. Here. Councillor Suds. Here. Councillor Tierney. Present. 
Uh, Count, uh, Vice Chair Dudas? Here. Great, so we'll now go through the consent agenda. Uh, declaration of interest, Declaration de Conflit d'Interest. Councillor Harder, please. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, Councillor Janet Harder, declare a potential deemed indirect pecuniary interest on the following report, 2021 budgets and special levies for BIAs, Business Improvement Areas, and Spark Street Mall Authority, as my daughter is the Executive Director of the Barhaven Business Improvement Area. Okay, thank you. Any other um, conflicts of interest to declare? No, confirmation of minutes, adaption de process de beau for the minutes of March 2nd, 2021. Carried? Carried. Uh, confidential Carried. minutes, uh, 21st of March, 2021. Carried? Uh, minutes one special joint FEDCO and CPS March 2nd, 2021. Carried. Carried. Update. Carried. Finance Services, uh, Director General des Services des Finances, Corporate Finance Service 2021 budget and special levies for business improvement areas and Spark Street Mall Authority, budget pour les zones d'amélioration commerciale et l'administration du mal de la rue Sparks. Councillor Harder is declared a conflict. She'll step away from her camera uh, on the uh, report as presented. Okay. All right. Okay. Received. Uh, item two, a report on budget expenses pursuant to Ontario Regulation 284-9, Rapport sur les dépenses budgétaires conformant au règlement de l'Ontario 28409. Carried. Okay. Uh, Disposition of 2020 tax and rate supported operating surplus deficit. We have a presentation on that. We'll come back to that. Uh, planning infrastructure and economic development services. It's planification de l'infrastructure de développement économique. Declaration of surplus 544 William Lindsay Court and 4160 Riverside Drive and transfer of what 4160 Riverside Drive to Ottawa Community Lands Development Corporation. Married. 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 Item five, agreement of purchase of sale with the National Capital Commission for property requirements associated with the Albert Street, Queen Street, Slater Street, Bronson Avenue reconstruction project. Carried. Carried. Uh, item six, uh, Ottawa Markets, uh, temporary delegated authority. Uh, we have a presentation on that from uh, Zach Daler of the uh, Byward Market and Parkdale Market Group. Uh, item seven, uh, we need a motion for this, Count Vice Chair Dudas. This is the Economic Update and Recovery Rebound Program by uh, the City of Ottawa. So, Count Councillor Dudas, please. Certainly, Mr. Mayor. Uh, where is the report titled COVID-19 Economic Update and Recovery Rebound Program was not circulated with the agenda? Therefore, it be resolved that pursuant to subsection 89.3 of the procedure bylaw, being bylaw number 2021-4, the Finance and Economic Development Committee approved that the rules of procedure be suspended to allow for the consideration of this item. On the motion. So we'll come back to that because there's a presentation and, and uh, people from outside the city that would like to speak to it. So that'll be our first item. Uh, we'll continue on with the consent agenda, planning services, service de planification, Brownfield grant application 36, 38, 40, 44, and 46 Robinson Avenue. Carried. Okay. Item nine, Brownfield grant application 875 Montreal Road. Carried. 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 Item 10, Brownfield grant program uh, application 180 Metcalf Street. Carried. Uh, item 11, Brownfield Grant Application 1354 and 1376 Carling Avenue. Carried. Carried. Uh, and information previously distributed, information distribué uh, auparavant, Economic Development Update Q3 2020. Received. 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 So I think we'll, we'll go back to the first item that has members of the public uh, here to speak, and that would be... Um, so 
Okay, so uh, we'll do number seven first, which is the COVID-19 economic update and recovery, because we have members of the public that would like to speak to that. Uh, and uh, the floor is over to Mr. Willis. This, for the members of the public who are watching, this is our economic update and recovery and rebound program uh, post uh, COVID-19. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of committee. I'm joined for this presentation today by uh, Don Herwire, Shayla Doherty, and Cindy Van Buskirk as staff available to answer questions on the uh, presentation. Uh, before I begin, I think it's really important that we acknowledge that we developed this economic rebound and recovery report before the province decided to apply the emergency break across, across the province the last uh, two weeks. Avant de commencer, je tiens à souligner que nous avons élaboré ce rapport sur la reprise économique et la rebond avant que la province ait décidé d'appliquer les freins d'urgence dans l'ensemble de la province. Nous connaissons tous les nombreux euh, propriétaires de petites entreprises qui ont des difficultés incroyables à ouvrir puis à refermer et le manque de stabilité amène de, de, de nombreuses petites entreprises au point de fermeture définitive. We all know many small business owners who are having an incredibly tough time with being opened then closed again, and the lack of stability this is bringing and taking many small businesses to the, the breaking point. As a municipal government, we have limited tools to offer a helping hand. Uh, the Municipal Act states that we cannot provide direct financial assistance to businesses. That is why at this point in the pandemic, we are so reliant on the federal and provincial governments to provide much needed direct support. Working together, we will get past this lockdown. As case counts drop and vaccine rollout progresses, we will eventually get from gray to red, to orange, to yellow, and eventually green. En travaillant ensemble, nous surmonterons ce blocage. Au fur et à mesure que le nombre de cases diminuera et que le déploiement du vaccin progressera, nous passerons de gris au rouge, à l'orange, au jaune, et éventuellement au vert. I want to thank Mayor Watson, Councillor Dudas, and Councillor El Shantiri for continuing to lead the Mayor's Economic Partners Task Force and for hosting our first Economic Rebound Roundtable in early February. I also want to thank Councillors Suds and Harder for joining the table uh, for that discussion at that key meeting with our partners. The plan I am presenting today is really our state of readiness to help when the restrictions begin to ease and we are in the tail end of the pandemic and beyond. Le plan que je présente aujourd'hui est vraiment notre état de préparation pour aider lorsque les restrictions commencent à s'atténuer et que nous sommes à la fin de la pandémie et au-delà. May I have the ne next slide, please? So the economic recovery and rebound objectives are listed on the screen before. We have presented these before, and this list of objectives has been confirmed in cooperation with the Mayor's Economic Partners Task Force, which includes the Ottawa Board of Trade, Ocobia, RGA, Invest Ottawa, Ottawa Tourism, Ottawa Festival Network, Ottawa Film Office, and OMIC. Our partners have participated and assisted us to develop this strategy and take these objectives into the strategy in terms of our five, econo our five objectives for economic recovery. If we can go to the next slide, please. So the impact of the, of the pandemic continues to be hard on the local economy. Uh, the statistics on this slide predate the current lockdown period. So this is, this is information that is a few months old, but it is the best information we have available at this point in time. We've talked in the past about uh, there being, uh, you know, a good good news and bad news story in Ottawa. You know, first and foremost, Ottawa is projected to be among the fastest cities in the country to rebound from the pandemic uh, economic effects. We've had a fairly modest GDP contraction in Ottawa compared to other major Canadian cities. But that being said, we've had disproportionate job losses in the small business sector, particularly in retail, restaurants, and services tourism, events, and live entertainment. And this has come with a disproportionate impact on women, immigrants, and racialized populations. We know that, for example, women are 1.8 times more likely to face unemployment than men are in this pandemic. And that because, could be because they work in precarious employment or because that they need to stop working because of childcare or elder care responsibilities. 
The good news is that the Conference Board of Canada forecasts the Ottawa Gatineau real GDP rate will, will rise by over 4% and an additional later this year in an additional gains of 3.5% in 2022. And it is among the strongest, if not the strongest economic recovery in all of Canada. The, we were getting recent employment gains before the current lockdown, and those are uh, our unemployment rate at 6.5% is higher than it was pre-pandemic. But again, it's quite an enviable position compared to the rest of the country where numbers are in double digits. But we continue to acknowledge that this is a K-shaped recovery, uh, and this is a situation where uh, some industries in Ottawa are doing very well, uh, even with lockdown conditions, and certain groups are hit particularly hard. The next slide, please. So our, in our economic recovery and rebound program, our recovery efforts will continue to focus on the small business sector and the res resumption of business activities. The rebound efforts will support to get us back to that pre-pandemic growth trajectory. And as I said, uh, we've continued to consult with our key partners in the Mayor's Task Force to give us advice on how to structure this rebound program and recovery program. It's going to be delivered in collaboration with partners. It's not only going to be delivered by the city, and I'll explain later in the presentation the aspects of the city's effort and then the aspects that are going to be delivered with partners. And, and above and beyond anything else, it will proceed as public health uh, regulations and guidelines permit activities to resume. And so it's completely tied to this. And we're in the starting blocks. We're in, a, we're in the sidelines in the state of readiness to begin, but it all depends on the restrictions being eased. We also know that our approach has to be nimble and it needs to be targeted so that as we learn more information on the sector's hardest hit, we will have to adjust and, and, and pivot our, our response to the areas in the greatest need to ensure that we're using our resources efficiently and effectively for maximum impact. And the timelines are entirely dependent on the recovery uh, pace. Next slide, please. So I'm going to break this presentation into recovery, which are city-led initiatives. I'm going to talk about 10 areas the city itself is working on. And then I'm going to talk about five areas in the rebound program, which is building for the future, where we're working with our key economic partners. So the city continues to be a key information resource, and our economic development team continually receives information on both uh, best practices for managing uh, businesses in the public health emergency and also programs for support at any level of government. And we have a mailing list which we, we push this information out to our key partners and, and individual businesses, and we also uh, update the city's website continually. We have told the economic development staff that uh, their 2021 work plan, like their 2020 work plan, was is on hold, and their top priority is to focus on triaging support to small businesses. So when businesses have trouble figuring out who to deal with in the city, they can contact economic development, and economic development staff will first and foremost assist them to find the right people to talk to to resolve their issues. And staff are being encouraged to be proactive in assisting businesses to support their recovery. The city itself will plan for its workplace reopening. And again, it's, it's contingent on public health conditions. Uh, there will be a plan uh, rolled out in the third quarter of this year about what the gradual and staged reopening of the city's workplaces will be. And uh, we are also want to be clear that we're planning for our return, even though we don't know the start date yet. And we encourage uh, other big businesses in the city and particularly the government of Canada to do the same, to be very clear that they're planning to return to work because our downtown businesses in particular uh, need that certainty that the that, that people are coming back. The fourth item is we continue to streamline processes and uh, to service small businesses. And our recent effort on the patio program is a really good example of, of where we try to do that. And we're working with our staff in uh, planning approvals and other areas of approvals within the city to uh, work on streamlining processes to assist in recovery. May I have the next slide, please? The city will be implementing further economic re recovery initiatives. Um, Mayor, Mayor Watson announced last week that our finance group will be reporting later uh, at the next FedCo on a small business tax class framework process on how we can consider that as an, a tool to assist the smaller businesses in our community. Our colleagues in um, our, our uh, recreation, culture, and facilities are 
proposing a 50% reduction in rental fees for its showcase city facilities. And they will look for uh, uh, using their delegated authority to particularly for not-for-profit groups that support the rebound of tourism festivals and special events to assist them and, and visitor destinations at Lansdowne Park as well. We will also continue our capital spending program, which is uh, continuing to, to put our own investment in our infrastructure facilities to support crucial jobs in the construction and trade sector. Next slide, please. The city will continue to look for opportunities to find infrastructure stimulus funding from senior levels of government. And we're monitoring all programs as they're announced by either the federal government or the province of Ontario. Uh, and we are prioritizing projects to support economic recovery. And we are, City's priorities remain the same priorities we've talked about before, which is mobility, innovation, tourism, social infrastructure, and public health realm enhancements in high tourism areas. And these are the, the elements that, that support economic recovery. Our economic development team also continues to support high economic impact projects, which is when an employer comes in with a major employment creation project, those, those applications through our various approvals process are fast tracked and we support uh, them through the holding them a hand, their hands through the process to ensure that they, they get their approvals in an expedited way. And, and two other uh, major projects that we continue to track are the Le Breton project and then the Ottawa Hospital's new civic campus, which is uh, going to be one of the largest construction projects in the history of Ottawa once it begins, and it's a major employment opportunity that's part of our building for the future in Ottawa. Mr. McDonald's group in ICS is going to be bringing forward a report later this year on a social procurement strategy, and this comes out of a direction from uh, Councillor Dudas at a previous FEDCO meeting, where we're looking at opportunities to identify uh, social procurement where we um, where the city is purchasing services or goods where we can have an opportunity to support uh, disadvantaged businesses uh, from the economic recovery and also from the long-term perspective of, of groups that are, you know, the um, women-owned businesses, uh, racialized businesses as well, uh, and minority businesses to support that as well. And that recommendation will be brought forward in the third quarter of the year. Next slide, please. So the, 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 the I just listed the 10 items that the city is working on directly in its, in its own bailiwick. These are the five programs that we're gonna be working on with key partners in our community. And this is about building back stronger and better in our community. These are broader at reaching and they will take more time to plan. And that's why we, while we're identifying these initiatives today, we will report on their progress through the remainder of this year and gives uh, FEDCO and council more information on these actual programs. So the first program is a consumer confidence program called Post Promise, which is people outside safely together. And this is a private sector led initiative, which where the Ottawa Board of Trade is actually taking the lead. They're our key partner in this. And it's about giving patrons of local businesses confidence that a business is committed to customer and workplace safety and preventing the spread of the virus. And this is, an, this is a cross Canada initiative that the Board of Trade is leading locally and will help support local businesses. And it'll include branding and, and other forms of uh, logos for people to know that the business is taking the, uh, the uh, safety practices very, very seriously. And it'll become an important part of building confidence for people to return to activities as restrictions ease. Our partners at Ottawa Tourism are working on a visitor and event strategy, and we need to provide uh, uh, considerable support to them for that because this is by far one of the hardest hit sectors in the local economy and will take the, uh, a while to bounce back. We need to position this group, this sector for recovery, and we need to invest in destination development and creating new attractions and experiences in the capital. And uh, you know, we look at the effort Ottawa put into in terms of 2017 and, and what that generated for Ottawa in terms of economic impact. So we know what's possible. Um, you know, we're looking at taking the next couple of years and putting that level of effort in over a number of years and, and taking some you know, signature milestone events such as the 200th anniversary of the Byward Market, for example, and programming events and activities that are really unique to Ottawa that will draw visitors from other parts of Canada and eventually from you know, North America and around the world. So our partners at Ottawa Tourism are taking the lead on this and we're there to support them on that. Uh, the mayor has, has come out quite publicly in advocacy for the Ottawa International, McDonald Cartier International Airport. We know that uh, Ottawa is at a disadvantage right now is that we do not have direct uh, 
flights from international destinations and the screening locally for that. Uh, that puts Ottawa's airport at a disadvantage of the other major airports in the country. And so the, many of the other airports who are in similar situations to Ottawa are working together and, and advocating to the federal government to open up the same opportunities to the Ottawa airport uh, that the other airports have. And we think this is entirely re reasonable and doable within our uh, local environment and would support uh, a number of businesses and the airport's long-term recovery. And our investment as well in, in bringing the, the uh, stage two uh, LRT to the, to the airport is a key part of that recovery strategy for the airport. The fourth item is we've been working on with a number of our partners uh, locally, which is the place branding for Ottawa. And this is working closely with Ottawa Tourism, Invest Ottawa and other groups as well, which is about communicating Ottawa as a great place to live, work and play, invest, study and visit. Uh, we have been, um, that work was a key priority last year. It had to be put on hold because of changing priorities last year, but we're resuming that work because it's an important part of creating that distinctiveness for Ottawa uh, as we come out of the recovery. And finally, uh, we do need to work with all of our partners in the various economic sectors on a new refresh of our talent strategy. Uh, Council previously provided support to Invest Ottawa to focus on talent in the technology sector. We need to broaden that approach and focus on attraction and retention in other sectors other than just technology. We're seeing problems in uh, talent attraction, for example, in the construction sector now and, and in other sectors that are not just technology oriented, although technology is still an important priority for us and we need to continue that work. So we need to address the skills shortages. We need to create experiential learning opportunities within our local market to take people who live in coming through the training systems at our post-secondary institutions and get them plugged into the employers in the local uh, market. And we need a particular focus on women, immigrants and racialized populations to uh, help fill that opportunities because we do have uh, you know, a great source of talent in the local community that needs to get plugged in with the industries that are hiring. And I want to commend at this point work that Invest Ottawa has been doing recently on their efforts to incubate and accelerate women-owned businesses. And that's a really good example of where we can have meaningful impact in this area. Next slide, please. So in terms of the next steps, we need to continue with the economic recovery program, and we will continue to monitor monitor key economic indicators uh, such as vacancy rates and employment, and we will report that to council through our regular reporting. We need to work with our partners to develop those elements of the economic rebound program. We will continue to work with the Mayor's Economic Partners Task Force and host a second economic uh, rebound roundtable in the fall. We will be leveraging uh, the expertise being built in our community and social services department to ensure that efforts to support renewed employment opportunities uh, do to have a gender and equity lens, to look at opportunities to support the hardest hit groups in women, immigrants and racialized communities. And we will be building a new post pandemic economic development strategy for the next term of council. Enfin, nous voulons exalter les résidents d'Ottawa et continuer de faire tout ce que vous pouvez pour soutenir vos voisins qui dirigent une petite entreprise. Utilisez votre pouvoir d'achat localement. Faites preuve de gentillesse envers un propriétaire de petite entreprise. Faites-leur savoir que notre communauté est, pour, est là pour les soutenir. Finally, we want to urge Ottawa's residents to continue to do everything you can to support your neighbors who run small businesses. Use your spending powers locally. Show an act of kindness to a small business owner. Let them know that our community is behind them. Thank you, Mayor and members of committee and for the opportunity to present today. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Mr. Willis. It's a very thorough uh, report. We have um, one piece of correspondence, uh, Ottawa Tourism in support of the um, staff recommendation and one member of the public uh, who would like to speak, Su Ling Ching, who is the president of the Board of Trade. So we'll uh, invite uh, Su Ling in. And I just want to say while we're inviting her in, uh, she has been a very active member of our economic task force and doing uh, great work on behalf of the business community. And um, we'll see if we can let Su Ling in now. Hello. Hi, Suling. We can hear you and see you. So the floor Fantastic. is for the next five minutes. 
Thank you, Mayor Watson. I'll keep my comments brief and I'll be following up with a written submission, but I just wanted to use this opportunity to uh, thank the city for their initiative and collaboration and to offer the uh, Board of Trade support for the Economic Recovery and Rebound Program. I know the tools that we have at the municipal level are limited, and so we appreciate your exploring all avenues to support the business community. Sorry, I think, uh, are you finished or did you get cut off? I think I got cut off, sorry. <laughs> All right, go ahead. <laughs> and to support the small business community. And I specifically wanted to commend the city in exploring uh, the small business tax class that was made available through the province. Um, I know not all municipalities have explored this and uh, we want to offer our full support as you await the uh, details of the regulations from the province and to offer to facilitate wherever possible a consultation with the business community. We'd also ask for us to not to explore just the 10% but up to the 30% and what the implications would be for the business community as a whole um, um, as that as a strategy for recovery. So we have continued to advocate uh, as we work in collaboration with you, also with the Ontario Chamber and the Canadian Chamber at all levels of government, as we are relying on them so heavily to support us through this time and specifically our small business sector. So we continue to support for the effective um, rollout and acquisition of the vaccine. Uh, we have submitted as recommendations for uh, changes to the framework um, as they pertain to businesses that are being shut down. And we actively look forward to working with the city on the post promise protocol to inspire business and consumer and workplace confidence. And also to continue to explore opportunities for policy and program recommendations to support the small business sector. So I just wanted to thank you again for your collaboration and to uh, let you know that the Ottawa Board of Trade uh, is fully supportive of the work that the city is doing in order to, to move our economy forward. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Suleen. There's a couple of colleagues that would like to ask you a question. Uh, Councillor El Shantiri, please. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you, uh, Suleen, for your uh, presentation and always uh, work and support at the Mayor's Task Force. My question to you, you mentioned we shouldn't be stopped at 10%, maybe we should go as high as 30%. Have you seen other municipality in Ontario has gone that way? We, my colleagues across Ontario, we have a small coalition that are working on this item. And, and with the exception of a couple, most of them are not, have not yet considered uh, this avenue yet. My question Sorry. to you is, you know, the city, we're recommending 10%. Do we know other municipalities if they're recommending more? No, I'm not aware of any of my colleagues that are recommending more. Okay, thank you very much. And thanks thank for- you. Right, Thank thanks. you. All right, thanks, Councillor uh, El Shantiri. Councillor Dudas, please. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Suling. And, and thank you for your participation on the task force and your involvement um, in terms of the collaboration with the city. I, I know in speaking with city staff, Mr. Willis, and, and just speaking in the business community that this is such an unpredictable and unstable time for them uh, with the provincially mandated regulations changing constantly and how difficult it, it can be. In terms of this plan, as Mr. Willis mentioned, you know, once again, it is, uh, it's, a work, it's a work in progress because we as a municipality are still trying to figure out what's going to come. Do you think that this plan in its entirety and that laying out the framework for where we want to be will provide some kind of you know, relief and stability to our businesses as they move forward, knowing that we have something in place? I think that's a very, um, a very uh, accurate comment. I think that the pre-planning 
um, is an important aspect of building consumer and business confidence. And even though we may have to be flexible in that, the fact that we have a plan and that there's such a high level of collaboration among stakeholders is very positive for Ottawa. And I think that um, it really sets Ottawa apart in terms of um, signaling our support for the business community. And I want to thank you again and, and all of our partners at the task force level and everyone in the community who's been working with the city to develop this. And I, I know that uh, city staff have done a phenomenal job. So thank you, Sue Ling, for, for participating. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Dudas. Um, thank you. Any other questions for uh, Sue Ling? Well, thank you very much, Sue Ling. And again, uh, we really appreciate all the extra hours you're putting into helping us uh, with our economic task force and, and your contributions we greatly appreciate it. So thank you. Thank you, Mayor Watson. Uh, so quest, just one quick question uh, that I have to staff and then we'll open it up to anyone else who has a question. Uh, Mr. Willis, what is a K-shaped recovery? So Mr. Mayor, excuse the jargon of a term. So K-shaped recovery is a, is a recovery that goes in two directions at the same time. So in Ottawa, our tech sector and public administration, public health sector, uh, we have booming employment in those areas. There's actually record levels of employment coming into those areas. But in the small businesses, retail, tourism, hospitality, we are having severe job losses. So we're getting both at the same time. And that's what the, the economists call a K-shaped recovery. Thank you. Uh, questions to staff, Councillor Dudas, do you have a question to staff? I do, yes. Yes. Um, so my question is, first of all, once again, I want to reiterate how much the, the work put together by staff to, to formulate this plan, because I know it hasn't been easy. But in part, that is that leads to my question in that, you know, we are constantly seeing shifts uh, by the province in terms of open close, what those means, the zones and, and the different aspects of that. How flexible, how much flexibility did you build into this plan? How will you be continuing to adapt it as we see progress and changes coming from the province? So Mr. Mayor, I thank the Councillor for her question. I think it's, it's at the heart of what we've built is a plan that is flexible to whenever we can start working uh, to reopen economy based on public health indicators. We, as I talked about that progression from gray to red to orange to green, we can, we can continue to do it. And it's built to be nimble in identifying the needs from small businesses from our partners and adapting our services uh, as we go. I have every expectation that we're going to be back giving you updated information, slightly different information as the recovery starts. Some areas, like if we had a major downtown um, recovery of people coming back to the offices, things would change very quickly in the downtown, but it's probably going to happen in a much more staged way, for example. So we're going to con continue to report to committee and talk about how we adjust and, and, and uh, change our strategy slightly based on the circumstances. But we're pretty certain we're targeting the right groups to focus in on uh, based on what we've seen in the last year. So this plan was built based on the tools that the city has in its toolbox, which as, as was brought forward by delegation is limited. Um, and it's quite extensive being that we are limited in our, our ability to, um, to do different things. For instance, we can't give money to a business. Um, my question is, it's actually quite specific. You know, we saw the, the changes come through the province even this weekend. And, you know, one of the images that kept popping up on social media was long lineups at a big box store, which I won't name, um, and people quite upset about that when we have small businesses that, you know, once again, are respecting the provincial mandate and limiting their capacity. Within this plan and within the city's mandate and ability to assist, how are we addressing that discrepancy, which continues and is persistent between what big boxes and big corporations can offer and get away with, it seems like, compared to some of our smaller businesses who are meeting the, the rules of uh, the province and still falling short of being able to make uh, their rent at the end of the month. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I mean, we certainly understand the frustration uh, in, the, in the small business sector in terms of what's going on. These rules are set by the province. Uh, they're set by uh, the public health experts at Queen's Park and on the advice of local uh, experts, but really the, the regulations are set by the province. We, the city has an obligation to, to work with those sets of rules as they come out. 
when we come out of recovery, we know that the bigger enterprises who've continued to make money don't need our attention. They really don't. And that's why the tax class strategy that the treasurer will be bringing forward focuses on the smallest businesses, because they're really the groups that need to do it. We also know that in the tourism areas, the main streets where our partners at Alcobia, for example, they're the businesses that are members of our BIAs, they're going to need our attention and we're going to be their partner in their recovery. So that's why we have a very laser targeted effort towards the sectors and the geographies of the city that need the help the most. The biggest businesses will, will recover as you know, it's not it's not an, uh, uh, without impact on them in the pandemic, but it's certainly very different than the smallest businesses who we want to put our attention on. Thank you, Mr. Ellis. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Great, thank you, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Cavanaugh, please. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Um, yeah, I really appreciate the emphasis you put on um, at, well, just stating a fact that women are disproportionately affected by, by the pandemic. It's uh, it's uh, shocking how how uh, deep it is, um, as well as a lot of uh, uh, groups, uh, racially diverse groups. It's um, it's it's very obvious. Uh, now, when we meet with these people um, to hear about their concerns, the number one thing is housing, and I just want to know how that fits in because um, that's with the with the price of housing right now, it's really driving up rent as well, and um, that is a, a major problem. What can we do on that level? So, so Mr. Mayor, this economic recovery strategy is focused towards the business sector. This is what its focus is. Our housing and tenure housing and homelessness plan focuses on the housing uh, strategy. And I don't know if Ms. Gray is on the line or, or any of her staff can assist me in responding, but we certainly do have our focus on building our own uh, projects, whether they be our regular investment or through the rapid housing initiative. Uh, both of those are important priorities for us. We are working on an inclusionary zoning strategy for new development, which will be uh, more information out shortly uh, on that strategy uh, to council. We are also monitoring very carefully the broader housing supply and availability, and that's part of the considerations going into our fifth plan as well looking for land supply requirements. So these are all, you know, the city doesn't have, again, total control over all of these items because the housing price shock that we're having right now is a nationwide shock. It's actually North America wide. There's been a, quite a distortion as a result of the pandemic, and I don't think we, ha we, we, we have to be very sensitive to the demands on our system and the most vulnerable people, but I don't think our ability to respond will, uh, is as great as the federal government's ability to respond to assist all, of the, all communities in Canada are facing the same problem. Yeah, yeah, and I hope that we're advocating um, to the federal government about that because that's, that's part of the economic recovery that I see. So... So I appreciate that. Thank Anything you. Else, Councilor? Hi. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, I see no one else on with their hand up. So uh, on this report received, see. Next is um, Economic Development Ottawa Markets uh, Temporary Delegated Authority. Uh, for this next item, um, I have the pleasure of welcoming Zach Daler, Executive Director of Marche d'Ottawa Markets, who joins us today. As you know, Ottawa Markets is the municipal services corporation tasked with the management of our beloved outdoor markets in the Byward Market and Parkdale Markets. Uh, Zach joined Ottawa Markets uh, team a little over a year ago and is leading in the rebuilding efforts. I want to thank him very, very much for his hard work and collaborative effort over the last year uh, because I've heard so many positive things since you've taken over. I know that you have a brief presentation for us today and I don't want to scoop you but let me say that I'm very pleased with your creative ideas to attract new programming and customers to the markets, including your farmer's first policy to make sure we give a leg up to local farmers and producers. Je suis très impressionné par tes efforts pour mettre l'accent sur les fermiers et les producteurs locaux. I'm very proud uh, that the City of Ottawa is supporting the launch of the new farmers and producers only market on York Street, which will start in May and run every Saturday until October. The York Street Farmers Market will support the growth of new farms from our region while supporting those who have been at it for decades. The city is providing $10,000 grant to the new Saturday market with the goal of supporting producers and making local food more accessible to downtown residents and for that matter for tourists and people from all over the city. Je suis fier que la ville contribue à cette nouvelle programmation qui appuie nos fermes locales. 
This funding will also uh, help with the participation of eight new farms that will make their debut at the York Street Farmers Market, and they include Apple Heart Farms, Ferme Lo de Rousseau, Ferme Bristol, Hedgerow Orchard, Rutabaga Ranch, Sweet William Farms, Urban Fresh Produce, and Vintage Soil Farm. I think this is very exciting, and I'm thrilled that uh, with the direction uh, that Zach and the board of directors that we have the uh, honor of appointing uh, have been working on for the last year. Again, thank you for your great work. And I know you have a PowerPoint presentation, so we'll ask uh, Zach to um, join the meeting. Hello there, Zach. Can you hear us? Hello, hello, Mayor Watson. Hello, uh, <laughs> members of the committee. And, and thank you very much uh, for that support. Uh, it's, it's really exciting and uh, rebuilding the farmer's market presence in, in Byward uh, is, is going to be um, an exciting uh, rebuild effort, but it's, uh, I think, time and, and we're at the right time to do this. So what I want to do today is just walk you through a little bit of our plan for the season and why uh, we're asking for the particular items uh, in front of you today. Uh, next slide, please. So when we were created uh, as a municipal service corporation really coming into force in, in 2018, uh, we were created to maximize the Byward and Parkdale markets potential uh, as unique year round places and destinations to purchase local produce and good, uh, goods. One of the things you'll hear us talking about a little bit more is the term public market. Um, both uh, Byward, in particular Byward, uh, not so much Parkdale, have evolved into a larger type market where you're, you're, you're seeing artisans and crafters. You're also seeing microprocessors and even sort of promotional items for, for local businesses or galleries. Uh, and so uh, we know that getting back to the farmers component of that is really important. And uh, we're looking to carve out a space where we can build that uh, effort and build a new home uh, for farmers that we hope will grow uh, into a longer term uh, uh, presence. Next slide, please. So to do this, uh, as you know, we were created in 2017, 2018. We were mandated by the city to manage Byward and Parkdale. And this exists right now under the current bylaw 2008, 448, 449. Under that bylaw, there's a, a variety of uh, measures that uh, exist uh, for those two uh, markets. Uh, over time, uh, those items have, whether they've become outdated or, or stale or needing to be refreshed. And so that was our major focus uh, from 2019 to 2020, uh, review of the proposal of a new operational procedure for the management of the outdoor market. Uh, we submitted this uh, this year to economic development for the management of the outdoor program. And that operational procedure is much larger and meant to sort of in parallel line up with the existing bylaw, but uh, line up as well with the public realm plan. We know that those two things are uh, a, a bit of a moving target as we plan and, and move forward. So out of that, we've pulled uh, some core components that are in front of you as a pilot delegate authority uh, for this year. So uh, I mentioned the public realm plan, which, which was approved uh, this year, which is a major uh, plan for the area and part of the rebuild. Um, so we're looking for the pilot uh, and delegate authority, uh, and we'll go over those items next. Um, one of the things that we'll be doing over the course of this year with the larger operational pr procedure and the delegated authority is continuing to monitor. So if you are familiar, which you should be, uh, council are our members. Uh, and so we present to you at an AGM every year. It is our intent that at that AGM, we would be updating uh, our operational procedures on a yearly predictable cycle uh, so that we can maintain a bit of flexibility as we, we continue to grow. Uh, and then in 2021, 2022, the repeal of the Parkdale and Byward Market bylaw will be coming online, at which point we hope that our operational procedure uh, can fill those gaps uh, for the management of outdoor spaces in line uh, with the public realm plan. Next slide, please. So to land at our operational procedure and then the elements that we're, we're talking about today, uh, we provided a notice of review starting in June, and that went out to our vendors, customers, uh, community, and BIAs that we were doing this process. We were drafting an operational procedure, and we were looking at new uh, rules for the market. Uh, then we completed a consultation of phone and virtual surveys uh, that we completed with Abacus Data here in Ottawa. Uh, we surveyed vendors and customers, over 500 uh, respondents. 
Um, and then uh, we had a feedback cycle, cycle from June to November. Uh, we met with the standholders executive in October uh, and we had received feedback from them in October. Uh, and we have been uh, continuing regular conversations uh, with their uh, president. Then we completed the draft operational procedure and submitted in November. Next slide, please. How are we landing on all of this? What, what is guiding us? Well, I mean, we had word of mouth sort of saying farmers and local produce were important, but how do we validate that? And that's what we did with the abacus survey. So you can see from our general uh, present or our general uh, survey um, that the top three reasons for visiting uh, Byward and or Parkdale, fresh fruits and vegetables to support local family outing. Next slide. Similarly, from our stakeholders, uh, they visited the market for fresh fruits and vegetables to support local to buy groceries. So again, it's very quickly sort of going through those two slides. We know and we have heard and we have now put numbers beside it that bringing back and supporting local produce, uh, local crafters and local artisans uh, is the key to rebuilding the experience in, in our public market program. So uh, next slide, please. Our steps to do this are asking to delegate uh, Ottawa Markets the authority to implement the Ottawa Markets Farmers First policy. This policy essentially gives us the authority to schedule the uh, farmers before all other market vendors. Uh, it gives priority stand allocation to farmers. Uh, they receive preferred pricing for stands. Um, applications to vend are accepted year round. Requires microprocessors and street food vendors to use locally provincially sourced egg, meat, honey, maple syrup, and liquid dairy farm products. Um, we will provide discounts uh, to microprocessors uh, on their stand permits when they demonstrate sourcing products directly from local farms. Um, we have a recommitment and a commitment to programming and activities that highlight and promote local farms. Uh, and then farmers are given the exclusive right uh, to use terms like homegrown, hand-picked, just-picked, grass-fed, pastured, uh, et cetera. As well, uh, we will be creating prior primary placement and incentives uh, for CSA-friendly farms for pickups uh, at both market locations. So we believe those uh, four components are essential to help with the rebuild this year. And, and you know, those farms that the mayor mentioned um, have all been really sort of uh, brought on board with the idea of this farmer's first policy and the direction that we're heading for the markets. Um, so as I said, the, the authority for the, the farmer's first policy will help us refocus our efforts. Uh, the authority for the fee schedule is an emphasis on incentive pricing uh, and, and reducing uh, the rates that we had, again, for local farmers and, and artisans and, and crafters who are uh, demonstrating that handcrafted component. Uh, and then the deadlines, we really just need to create a predictable schedule that everybody can understand and know when the applications are, when they're open, when the feedback is, really in, in some ways modernizing the operations of the, the market from, from years past. Um, and then the placement of vendors is really important because right now the way that it, it, it functions, uh, we have a bit of a, a gap uh, around the building in certain locations. Uh, and what we're trying to do is we wanna take the authority to place vendors, obviously with the, their feedback in mind and, and the eye to the best economic uh, opportunities for sales, um, but to curate a, a dynamic and, and flowed experience around the building um, for our customers. Next slide, please. So our next steps for this and, and to put these pieces into place are the York Street Farmers Market on Saturdays, which was noted. And again, thank you for that support. That's, that's great. Uh, and, and we hope that this will become a, a new staple and, and uh, create the business case for farmers to grow back up and to scale back uh, potentially to, to seven days a week. Uh, we'll be launching the Parkdale Night Market, which expands the offerings there uh, quite a bit. And that market, uh, again, um, has a, a wholesale and farmer presence. Uh, the operational procedure that I mentioned uh, lays out that our wholesalers can only sell Canadian product on the market. So that's Canada, Ontario, region. Uh, you should not see pineapples uh, being sold on the market or bananas. Um, that's, you know, we're really looking to tighten up uh, that Canadian product for the wholesale category as well. Uh, for the entire year, we're operating under COVID protocol. Um, obviously, uh, we're seeing gatherings um, with fixed and unfixed furniture um, for the market. Uh, what that means is about 50% uh, less uh, vendors because we're providing spacing in between, sanitization around the market. 
uh, distancing decals, staffing, and, and, and guidelines at both markets. And those will not change for, for the season uh, for some predictability and to help build a sense of safety for our customers. Uh, over the course of the year, we're evaluating the physical structure needs to support continued growth of a farmer presence. Uh, some of the things that, that are a real problem down here in Byward in particular uh, is a lack of power, uh, lack of water access. Uh, some of these things that modern venues and locations can offer, but just over the years of 200 years almost, uh, we just haven't uh, built back into to our infrastructure, but the public realm plan definitely considers those items. Um, and then update of the 2019-2020 completed operational procedure uh, to support the public realm plan and the bylaw uh, repeal process. Uh, so hopefully that uh, highlights, next slide please, uh, what we are, are doing. Uh, and we had a local artist uh, provide a, a wonderful render uh, of what we hope you can experience at our outdoor farmers market on York Street uh, starting in September. And of course, uh, the area will be open seven days a week uh, under COVID protocols to access the finest art, craft, uh, and micro-processed products we have to offer at both Parkdale and Byward. Thank you. Great. Well, that's a, a very um, well thought out uh, proposal and uh, looks very colorful. I just want to read a, a note I received from Councillor Leeper. I uh, said, I have a conflict and can't make Fedco on markets. So if there's any questions, I'm fully supportive and can share that the markets, BIA community members and I have already been talking about a collaborative approach to the Parkdale market. So we thank Councillor Leeper for that. Just uh, out of um, clarity, Zach, uh, York Street is, is where you had the, the vision for the Saturday market. Is the, the Monday to Saturday and, and Sunday uh, going to remain where it is now? It's, so this is just an add-on to what's already there on um, in parallel to the bio market building. Yeah, this year, uh, the major difference there is we'll be tightening up all the vendors around 55 byword. Um, so taking them from where they previously had been on, on Byward Market Square side, bringing them up tight to our building, uh, because working with our neighbors, uh, we understand that curbside pickup is going to be really important this year. Um, and so we want to make sure that in our plans, we considered that. Um, but we have every intention of, of obviously expanding uh, out from our building over the years. Challenge I noticed last year was there were very few uh, farmers and, and uh, you know, we, over the years, you know, I guess we've been a victim of our own success at having markets all over the city now, but was uh, COVID one of the reasons why we didn't have as many uh, farmers uh, along uh, the building? Yeah, I, I, I think that's, that's fair uh, to say COVID as well as a uh, number of retirements. Uh, I joke, I, I don't meet uh, many vendors who don't say they weren't born on the market. <laughs> it's, it's crazy. Um, so uh, we are definitely in a transition phase. Um, but also one of the things to keep in mind, uh, a lot of the produce that was there on Byward Market Square over the years was wholesaling. Uh, and so we've tightened up uh, those rules to be Canadian product, which will take time to allow those individuals to scale back up to that level. I'm glad you're, you're getting rid of pineapples. It would open the pineapple on pizza debate, which is too divisive uh, at this time. Uh, Carol, Councillor Carol Ann Meehan has a question for you. These are questions oh, for um, Zach. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, Zach, uh, great presentation. Um, I guess I could put my video on, but you don't want to see me. Um, my question is, uh, over the years, I know that we've had uh, some challenges uh, and conflicts actually between many of the farmers and resellers who um, take up many of the stalls down in the market. Um, and and uh, a little bit of disappointment from some of the people coming by and knowing that they're getting, uh, you know, vegetables that they could possibly buy in fresh cohort, et cetera. Um, is that where we still going to see that? Are we still going to see a great number of resellers down in the market? Uh, so you will see resellers in the market at both markets. Um, but what we've done to tighten up sort of what you're talking about is, again, putting that Canadian provincial and regional sort of tag on what they can sell. And then mm -hmm. we'll give them uh, pricing incentives for selling local products. So if they bring in a local farm, uh, we'll, we'll support them in, in that way. Uh, one of the, the things with wholesaling that is important is, 
Um, again, uh, we believe, and 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 as we evaluate product, that it's coming from from regional regional farms, is uh, oftentimes that wholesale product can be a little bit cheaper on the market seven days a week, which is a bit of that access uh, component. Not everybody can afford to say go to the the Saturday market and buy tomatoes at a premium price or buy cucumbers at a premium price. So still having that product available on the market is important. What we need to do is make sure that we're monitoring the product that's being sold so that again we're not creating a scenario where for instance the wholesaling can undercut the market but that it understands that they sort of coexist potentially for for different sets of customers it is a it is a fine um, balance to strike um, but i do suspect over time with the farmer's first policy we should see a reduction of wholesalers uh, or multiple wholesalers, we might not, we might have one, but they might take up more space. So it's uh, trying to get back to a place of balance between the two. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, what I know that one of the challenges is that our growing season, when you want to put the, the market up and, and have it busy, it's difficult to get the product uh, if it's, if it hasn't been harvested yet to get the product in there. So how do you anticipate uh, dealing with that? Uh, we just need to maintain uh, a flexible market schedule. One of the major things with the York Street Farmers Market that we're gearing up to do and, and uh, follow us on uh, social media, it's our, we're doing an education campaign this week, or this month rather, uh, is educating people about the growing season. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, a lot of people show up at the market in, in May and are ready for tomatoes. <laughs> tomatoes really haven't even fully sprouted uh, at, at that point. Um, so it's, it's, we are developing a, a significant education component as we go forward. Uh, we do believe that educating the city uh, about food security, about <clears throat> proper growing practices uh, is all part of realigning the expectations of what they can expect. Um, and it is an education process. It's, all, it's about behaviors too. So uh, this isn't gonna happen overnight and we just need to stay consistent uh, with what we're doing. So again, that idea of just okay. consistent market offerings on Saturday, education pieces, uh, and then working with the farmers to understand that uh, the, mm. the growing can be in flux from time to time. Okay, one last question. Um, have you surveyed the local farmers to see who would actually in, be in favor of who was interested in, in, in setting up in the market? Yep, so we, uh, our, our market managers are, are in regular correspondence with regional farms in terms of cold calls to, to ones that we have uh, worked with in the past. And that's how we landed on the Saturday market. I, is we believe that that is sort of what uh, can be handled right now uh, with those local regional farms. And not to mention, uh, we are targeting new farms. So under two years, it's free for them to participate on the market. So um, I guess I would put out there, if there's any farms that, that maybe haven't been, been contacted, please send them our way and uh, we'll definitely be in touch. Okay, I appreciate that. Thank you so much. That's it for me. Great, thanks, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Harder, please. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, that was a really good uh, presentation and uh, it's nice to see a, a fresh face uh, with new ideas. I have a question for you about um, the springing up of um, so-called markets all over the city and every church parking lot and you know every park and ride we can possibly dish out. Um, and understanding that many of our independent, uh, like in, for the your independent um, label for sure, but where we have franchise owners already support the local farmers on everything that they grow. Do you feel that allowing the setup with the pop-up of these markets all over the place um, is, is a great disadvantage to what you're trying to do? Um. Short answer would be yes, but um, it, it's important because of access to food and access to the education of a farmer's market that these, these locations sort of are there. So there, there's no dispute about a farmer market. Um, what we're trying to do is uh, put together a larger program that we hope can support that education and that food security, but also the delivery of a quality professional market to standards that uh, farmers can expect, whether that be in Byward or Parkdale or another location, to really just coordinate that um, because the competition is really odd. We're, we're competing to get good food to people 
uh, and education to people when, when that's not really, I think, the best way to go about doing it. Um, so the proliferation of markets on private property is absolutely a challenge um, because, again, how we, we view it is uh, we're looking to create a, a larger program that not only uh, anchors uh, public space, um, like here in, in Byward, but is a valuable uh, addition to the city. Uh, you know, we're, we're almost 200 years old, uh, probably one of the older markets in, in the country, if not the oldest market in the country. Um, and I think no matter who you talk to, they sort of say it's, it's time that we sort of really push uh, to make it that program and, and to make it one of the better market programs in the city, if not the coordinating body. So I think we'll get there, but I think we have a lot to prove uh, over the next couple of years with our market concept on Saturdays. And we need to continue working with the farmers uh, in that community to make sure that there's the trust there so that we can uh, continue to scale up and, and grow. Thank, thank you very much. Great, thank you, Councillor Harder. Councillor Fleury, please. Yes, Mr. Mao, good morning, Zach. Uh, simply want again to reaffirm that it's been a pleasure uh, working with you. It's been a challenging year and, and you and your team have been on the ground adjusting. Uh, for everyone on, on the call, Zach and the team and the city has worked closely on a lot of the street closures in the buyer market, including William, York and, and parts of Clarence. So I, I'm seeing strength and collaboration uh, in the market with, with Zach and, and his team. Uh, I'm excited about what the potential of York can be. I don't think we can expect farmers to be committing seven days a week, but I think, you know, the, the, the one day on the weekend or the two day on the weekend or is some, something that's a little more realistic. And, you know, uh, Scott Moffat and I had a conversation a few, uh, few days ago with local farmers just to understand what's feasible, what's happening across the city. And Zach, I know that you're doing the same. So it's exciting to, uh, to see a, a reset of uh, local local produce, local uh, support for farmers in the Byron market. And obviously I know how challenging the existing bylaw has been for you. And, and I'm glad to see that, you know, you're, you're putting in new procedures this year. And I know that uh, as a council, we'll be looking at the repeal of that bylaw later on. So again, tip my hat off. I know it's not an easy period to uh, to lead that, that transition, but uh, I know you're up for it. You and your team are up for it. So uh, thanks again. Great, thank you, Councillor. Uh, anyone else have any uh, questions or comments, Zach or to staff? So on the report uh, before us, carried, adopted. Carried. carried. Thank you. Our last item on the agenda is um, a presentation by our, I believe, Treasurer and Deputy Treasurer uh, with respect to the disposition of 2020 tax and rate supported uh, operating surplus and deficit. So uh, over to you. Uh, Madam Treasurer. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Mayor, and good morning, everyone on the committee. Um, while Carol's pulling up the presentation, I'd just like to provide some opening remarks. 2020 was a year that our finances became very uncertain in the face of COVID. And faced with that uncertainty, staff put in place various financial mitigations to offset our pressures of COVID for our response, including mitigations to fill those gaps if we needed to do so. And with the announcement of the Safe Restart Agreement and its associated funding, our finances became more certain, allowing the city to continue its response to the pandemic and provide our much needed services to our residents. The city is very appreciative in terms of the various streams of funding that we've received from other levels of government, both in 2020 and in 2021. And as highlighted in the report, the city was able to cover off all of its 2020 COVID pressures with a small exception of $3.6 million in our transit pressures that fell outside our funding period. Our senior leadership team implemented various financial mitigations, such as a hiring and discretionary spending pause, which left the city in a good financial position as we entered 2021. And as per our policy, the 2020 surplus is directed to our reserves and it provides a much needed and future nest egg when we need it. We don't normally provide an update on our first quarter finances, but given our COVID, our continued COVID response, the context is important today as we move through 2021. So after the review of our 2020 disposition this morning, we'll provide an update on our forecast for 2021 and its associated funding sources that will help us fill those gaps. And again, thanks to the Safe Restart funding from other levels of government, we made it through 2020 and we're now cautiously optimistic for 2021. 
and we have to continue to be prudent now as we look forward to 2022. So I'll ask Carol to pull up the presentation and I'm going to pass it over to Isabel who will start on slide number two and walk us through uh, our 2020 disposition. Thank you, Wendy. Um, so as part of the year-end process and preparation for the city's financial statements, it's necessary to obtain council approval of the disposition of any surplus or funding of any deficit. This presentation summarizes the results of the 2020 operations for all tax and rate supported city programs. The citywide tax supported services ended the year with a 21.977 million surplus in comparison to the 2020 forecast surplus of 13 million that was reported to council last October in the 2020 Q2 status report. Les services d'appui fiscal à l'échelle de la ville ont, ont terminé l'année avec un excédent de 21.977 millions de dollars par rapport de, à l'excédent prévu de 13 millions de dollars pour 2020 qui a été signalé au conseil en octobre dernier dans le rapport d'étape du deuxième trimestre de 2020. The previous forecast did not include police, transit and library. The total tax supported surplus including these three services is 13.9 million. Rate supported services finished the year with a 3.7 million surplus primarily from drinking water services. The COVID deficits in 2020 were mostly offset by funding from the provincial and federal government so that the total surplus of 17.6 million essentially reflects the non-COVID related financial results of the city for 2020. These non-COVID-19 surpluses are primarily due to initiatives implemented by senior management to help mitigate any unfunded COVID-19 budget pressures, such as the discretionary spending and staffing pause. These surpluses can now be returned to reserves and used to help offset any additional unfunded COVID-19 pressures in 2021 or in future budgets if required. Next slide. Most of the service areas reported surplus in 2020 and most were primarily due to the discre discretionary spending and staffing pause. There were some additional surpluses in many of the service areas, such as higher revenues from traffic control installations offset by expenses related to the automated speed enforcement program and transportation services, lower social housing expenditures offset by higher emergency shelter costs and community and social services, including lower demand for employment related expense benefits. There was a recovery of HST rebates from previous years in recreation, culture and facilities. In financial services, there were additional revenues from water and tax billing services and from cost savings. There were increased revenues from inspection, temporary encroachment, pool enclosure and development fees in PIDE. There were savings from reductions in training and testing in ICS. And non-departmental reflected lower financial financing charges, higher supplementary assessment revenues and higher than expected revenues from the speed enforcement program offset by higher tax permissions and lower rates on return of investments. Library services also reported a surplus mainly due to part-time staff placed on emergency leave and facility closures. There were also deficits in three service areas. In emergency and protective services, the deficit was primarily attributable to the reimbursement of a 2019 related provincial surplus of 3.8 million in funding to the province for paramedic services and increased departmental WSIB costs. Transit services reported a deficit of 13.2 million, which includes a deficit from transit taxation related accounts. The operating deficit for transit excluding these accounts is 11.1 million, which is lower than the deficit forecast in the Q2 report in October last year. Much of this deficit is attributable to the O-Train service mitigation costs reduced re revenues due to a 2020 fare freeze as decided by council, non-recoverable COVID-19 costs of 3.6 million for March, and higher liability claims, all of which was offset by uh, some operational savings. Police services ended the year with a small operating deficit of 600,000 in deficits in police taxation related accounts. Next slide. The drinking water surplus of 4.4 million is from vacancies, utility and debt servicing costs, savings and lower repair costs due to a mild winter, partially offset by lower revenues from a consumption shift between billing rate tiers as consumption shifted from the industrial commercial sector to the residential sector during the pandemic. The wastewater services deficit of 194,000 is also primarily due to lower revenues from consumption from the consumption shift 
And the stormwater deficit of 436,000 is due to lower revenues from consumption of shift between tiers offset by higher revenues due to higher growth on the number of properties. Next slide. This table summarizes the recommended disposition of surplus and deficits to and from reserves to, for each area. The citywide surplus of 21,977 million would be returned to the tax stabilization reserve, except for 170,000, which would be returned to the citywide capital reserve to pay for the completion of the winter maintenance quality standards review. This was funding provided in 2020 for this review, but was not fully spent due to delays caused by COVID-19. The 1.1 million deficit for police services will be funded by the tax stabilization reserve. The transit deficit of 13.2 million will be funded by the transit capital reserve. There's insufficient funds in the transit operating reserves to cover this deficit, but as you may recall, close to 32 million in transit capital projects were deferred in 2020 and 20.4 20 million in transit cash funding from those projects were returned to the transit capital reserves. The 6.22 million surplus from library reserves will be returned to the library from from the library services will be returned to library reserves and as approved and recommended by the library board. Five million of these funds will be contributed to the central library capital project. The surplus in drinking water services will be returned to water reserves and the wastewater and stormwater deficits will be funded by their respective reserves. Next slide. The total COVID-19 deficit for 2020 was 238.5 million compared to the estimated 181.8 million reported to budget in the budget directions report presented to council in October 2020. The déficit total de COVID-19 pour 2020 était de 238.5 millions de dollars comparativement aux 181.8 millions de dollars estimés déclarés dans le rapport sur les orientations budgétaires présentées au conseil, au conseil en octobre 2020. The previously reported 181.8 million deficit included both citywide and transit services projected COVID-19 pressures, but did not include auto police services or public health. It also reflected the cost of COVID-19 for social services net of the Social Services Relief Fund or SSRF funding. In order to report the full impact of COVID-19 and all sources of government funding received to address the municipality's pandemic budget pressures, this report includes the total COVID-19 gross budget pressure for all service areas. The total COVID-19 related pressures include not only additional costs to respond to the pandemic, but also lost revenue, all of which is offset by some COVID related cost savings. There were a total of 110.3 million in additional costs incurred by the city, such as PPE, cloth masks, sanitizers, retrofit supplies and equipment, enhanced cleaning, IT hardware, software for staff telework and increased costs in social services for housing, long-term care, COVID containment and prevention, children's services, and also extraordinary COVID expenses incurred by public health. Cost savings totaled 56.7 million helped to reduce these budget pressures. Much of the COVID related savings were due to the fact that the facilities were closed and operating expenses, expenditures were no longer required or were significantly reduced. The cost reductions are comprised of savings from placing part-time um, casual staff and effective programs on declared emergency leave, utility savings for closed facilities, reductions in hiring of student positions and a reduction in materials, fuel and supplies resulting from service disruption. The total revenue lost in 2020 COVID, due to COVID was 184.8 million. Much of the revenue reductions were due to recreational cultural facility closures, reductions in parking fines, red light camera revenue, investment income, interest revenue, penalties collected, share of OLG revenues, and most significantly due to drop in transit ridership and fare revenue. The overall COVID de deficit for citywide operations was 107.9 million, 108.3 million for transit, 3.6 million for police and 18.7 million for public health. Next slide. So this slide provides a good overview of the service areas most significantly impacted by the pandemic. 45% of the total budget pressures were in transit, 21% in community and social services, 8% in emergency and protective services and another 8% in auto public health. These four service areas made up 82% of all the COVID budget pressures in 2020. Next slide. A total of 345 million in government funding was allocated to Ottawa in 2020, which could be used to fund COVID pressures in 2020 and any remaining funds used in 2021. 
Of the 345 million, 238.1 million was used to fully recover the city's COVID budget pressures in 2020, with 103 million of that funding that can be deferred and used to fund the city's 2021 COVID budget pressures. COVID funding in 2020 was received from various sources and programs, primarily the provincial and federal government, but also including FCM and CMA. Three key funding sources came from Safe Restart Agreement Phase 1 and 2 for the municipal stream and the transit stream and also the Social Services Relief Fund. There were also specific COVID funding programs for children's services, the Federal Reaching Home Program, Paramedics, Temporary Pandemic Pay Program, Ministry of Health funding for public health and other smaller programs geared to specific initiatives, initiatives or issues. Wendy will now speak to the funding and projected COVID pressures for 2021. Well, thanks very much, Isabel, and you can move to the next slide, Carol. Thank you. Um, so as noted in my opening remarks, this is something that we don't normally update you on at the first quarter, um, but given uh, we're still in the midst of COVID and our response, I think the context, context is really important this morning as we move through 2021. So I'm going to walk you through the updated forecast to year end and some of the most recent funding announcements can, so you can really have a good understanding in terms of where the, the city is sitting financially. Um, what I've highlighted on this slide for you this morning is three buckets or areas that are aligned with the funding that we've received from other levels of government that really provides a snapshot of where we stand and what we're going to cover this morning. So we'll start with that first area and that being transit. And the 2021 budget assumed that ridership would start the year around 30% and it would eventually make its way up to approximately 90% with an overall average ridership of about 70%. Um, we know that actual ridership is trending lower than that. Uh, it's not aligning with our budget assumption. And our ridership started this year uh, at 18% and it's currently sitting at 27% as of March. And we know that the current lockdown will impact ridership as well. So based on the actuals for the first three months and the current four week imposed lockdown, and what I would suggest is really a worst case view to the end of the year, meaning our ridership does not improve or increase beyond the current levels. Our projected year end forecast changes from what we had originally predicted at $72.8 million to a pressure of approximately $153.5 million. And again, you know, I want to stress that this is a worst case scenario and the forecast will naturally improve as our ridership increases as we move through the year. And then we moved to our funding bucket as we look at this slide. And uh, to mitigate this pressure, the city has confirmation of the following funding sources. So you see $135.3 million on the slide. And that comes from other levels of government. So we have $62 million um, from the Safe Restart funds that cover January to March of 2021. And then there was an announcement of an additional $73.3 million, which includes the $56.4 million, which was announced very late last year, and an additional $16.9 million, which was announced in early March from the province for 2021. And we heard at Transit Commission uh, that there will be some savings in terms of some of the service adjustments that are gonna reduce expenses by $5 million this year. And that leaves us with a very small gap of $13.2 million in terms of uh, the funding gap. And to close this gap, we have the following mitigations in place. So during its last funding allocation, the province called upon the federal government to match its last uh, allocation of COVID funding. And if this funding is matched uh, with the tabling of the federal budget uh, in April, this would close the gap. We also have various other financial mitigations in place, including our spending pause, our hiring pause, and uh, potentially the capital deferral funds from 2020. 
So that's an overview of transit. As we move to our municipal bucket um, and our municipal funding stream, and we go back to uh, when we tabled the budget and what we had thought those pressures would be, they were approximately $50.565 million. And we know today that those have increased to $56 million. And the increase or change in that forecast is really due to two things. So the first piece is around a uh, reduction in our air airport pills, and that's $4 million. And it's really due to the low passenger counts that we had in 2020, as those are reflective as we move to the following year. And we've seen some increased expenditures related to our COVID-19 response of approximately $1.4 million. To mitigate this pressure, the city has confirmation of the following funding sources. So we have $62.2 million earmarked in funding from other levels of government. And included in that, we have $8.5 million that was carried over from unused or unallocated funding from 2020 from the Safe Restart Fund, as well as uh, $54.3 million in Safe Restart Funds, which includes $20.9 million, which was again announced late last year, and an additional $33.4 million, which was announced in early March from the province uh, for 2021. So currently uh, in this bucket, there's no funding gap. And finally, um, when we look at uh, the, the budget for the social services relief fund. So this is largely the pressures that we're seeing in community and social services. When we built our forecast for the 2021 budget, um, we had forecasted approximately $24.435 million for its efforts to support our local community agencies uh, with respect to their COVID-19 impacts and uh, our operation of our respite and isolation centers across the city. And these expenditures have been funded by the Social Services Relief Fund. So when we do a bit of a retake in terms of our year-end forecast, that pressure is now $44.8 million. And to mitigate this pressure, we do have confirmation of the following funding sources through the Social Services Relief Fund. So we have $38.3 million in funding um, from other levels of government and it's uh, in two triages. So we have $16.8 million for the first three months of 2021 and uh, $21.5 million from April to December. And again, that announcement was made in early March. And that leaves us uh, with a very small funding gap of $6.5 million. So rolling this up into the big picture uh, and our revised forecast of the overall COVID pressures, they've increased from 153.5 million to approximately 254.3 million and largely due to the revised transit forecasts. The city has confirmed funding and strategies in place for 240. $8 million of that, really leaving us with a very small overall net funding gap of $13.5 million. So I think the city is in uh, good shape as we move through 2021. You can move to the next slide, please. Uh, so this slide highlights the mitigations that we have in place. Um, and again, as I mentioned in the previous slide, we're awaiting the federal budget tabling in April uh, for additional assistance to municipalities. So we will hear some of that news uh, when the federal budget is tabled on April the 19th. And secondly, we know that improvements in transit ridership will naturally lower the budget pressure and the funding gap. So we'll be monitoring that and reporting back uh, to make committee and council as we prepare our Q2 and our year-end forecast, uh, which will come uh, in the fall of 2021. And we're continuing with our discretionary spending pauses, as well as our discretionary hiring pauses. You can move to the next slide, please, Carol, thanks. And this is just a snapshot in terms of our reserve fund balances. So you can see our 2021 opening balance for reserves was approximately 458 million as compared to our opening balance in 2020, which was 403 million. The increase in the balance is primarily due to the funds that we returned to source from our capital close and our deferred projects in 2020. And the opening balances also include the amounts contributed uh, from and to reserves uh, per the year-end disposition of surpluses and deficits and other adjustments that have been made throughout the year. 
So the key reserves impacted by our capital close deferrals and year-end surpluses and deficits have increased since last year, and that'd be the tax stabilization reserve, our citywide capital, our transit capital, our rate reserves, and our library reserves. You can move to the next slide. Thank you, Carol. So just some concluding comments. Uh, despite the impacts of COVID-19 on the city's finances, the city has ended 2020 on a positive note, which provides us much needed financial flexibility as we move forward. While our COVID pressures were greater in 2020, they were covered by funding provided by senior levels of government, allowing the city to continue its response to COVID-19 and continue our much needed day-to-day -day services to our residents. As we move into 2021, despite our uh, revised forecast, our finances are in good shape and I remain cautiously optimistic. We have secured funding from other levels of government and mitigations and they are in place. Um, the mitigations are in place in terms of filling any remaining gaps. So as I noted uh, in a couple of slides previous, this is a preliminary review of our finances uh, and our year end forecast and we will bring an update uh, for quarter two and the year end uh, early in fall as we always do. Uh, merci, Monsieur Chapin, c'est la fin de cette présentation. Great, thank you very, very much, Wendy and Isabel. It's a very thorough report and we're very fortunate to have uh, both of you in leadership roles in the finance department. Uh, just a couple of quick things. One is um, uh, when the federal government announced the doubling of the gas tax on a one-time basis, that obviously will go uh, towards capital budget, not the operating budget. So that'll be reflected once we receive it, I suppose. Um, and I guess just um, a, a cautionary note with respect to 2022, it looks like we're, we're landing in a pretty good spot in 2021, but uh, I think we have to prudently anticipate that there'll be challenges in 2022, uh, given the fact that we don't know when COVID is going to finally uh, end, and uh, we will continue to see challenges at, at OC Transpo. So uh, your advice with your recommendation is, that these dollars from the surplus that we garnered last year should remain in the reserve funds because that in essence is our rainy day fund really for 2022. What a fair assessment. Uh, yes, Mr. Mayor, it's a very fair assessment. It aligns with our reserves policy that we have here at the city. And, you know, we don't have that crystal ball um, to have that look into 2022 as of yet. So we have to prepare in terms of having to help ourselves. Okay, thank you. We'll go now to uh, committee members first. Uh, Councillor Gower, questions to staff or comments? Uh, yes, thank you, Mayor, and thank you, Wendy and Isabel, for the presentation. I had a couple questions. One was um, page six of the staff report goes into details about the surplus com for community and social services. And I was wondering if you can just clarify the, the lower demand for employment related benefits of 2.2 million. Um, that just seemed strange to me, given the previous report from Mr. Willis about the increased unemployment in uh, in our area. So what's accounting for that? that big uh, drop in demand of 2.2 million. Thank you, Councillor. It's actually a direct correlation to the benefits that were offered by the federal government. Um, so when we think about the CERB, uh, folks um, chose to take that benefit over our employment services benefit. So uh, it actually gave us a bit of a surplus as a result. Okay, that's interesting. Um, and then I guess the other question I had was in general on our reserve accounts, how do you determine what's appropriate to keep in the reserve accounts and how how's the general health of our reserve? How would reserves, how would you characterize that uh, where we're at right now in, uh, in 2021? Uh, very good question. Uh, we had done a reserve study in 2018 um, and brought that study and policy to council for approval um, with recommended levels uh, as to what should sit in each of those reserves. We're actually uh, very, very close um, in terms of our tax stabilization reserve. It's, it's around where it should be at the higher end, which is, uh, I think, very good news for us. Um, I think we know uh, we have not achieved what we need to achieve in terms of transit for their operating reserve and their capital, um, but most are getting to where they need to be. Okay, thanks very much. Great, thank you. Councillor Shantiri, please. 
Thank you, uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you, uh, Wendy and Isabel, for your presentation. Uh, again, Wendy, on slide six, uh, you talk about uh, the deficit with the public health. Uh, isn't that cover at least 80% of it by the province? Am I wrong on this one? In terms of public health, um, there's actually a separate funding stream for them. So we know and we've received confirmation um, that uh, their deficit for 2020 will be covered 100% by the province. Um, they have also provided us with something similar for 2021, but we just haven't confirmed those numbers as of yet. So um, that's why you're not necessarily seeing all of the details in our presentation that speak to that, but we know for this particular piece, we will be reimbursed 100%. And, and what about the, uh, if there is uh, additional cost uh, like uh, uh, for the vaccination or for, for bylaws or for police, isn't, the, isn't also the province uh, is helping to cover all identifiable cost, the COVID related cost? Yes, exactly, Councillor. Um, they have provided a letter to say that they're going to cover all of our costs with respect to the vaccine rollout. So uh, we're just going through a process right now. We're tracking everything. And then that um, I'm going to say the entire process to make that claim uh, will um, be provided to us at a later date. And so would you give us another update, basically? Like I know, you, you know, quarterly is, is, is should that be more than quarterly? You feel we should be keep an eye on what's because, as the mayor mentioned, twenty one is, is okay. But I mean, we, we are facing twenty two, and we're preparing for the budget of twenty two. So, uh, is is an update to, to this committee should be recommended more than just quarterly? We will come back at quarter two, um, and that is my suggestion that we do do that. Uh, it will give us a very good view to the end of the year as to where we forecast we're going to land. Um, the first quarter is difficult, I'll be very honest with you. So our recommendation is that we come back uh, at the end of the second quarter, provide another update to you, and that update will have that year-end forecast. So you'll have a good idea in terms of where we're going to land, as well as we should know all of our funding sources at that point in time as well. Okay. Thank you very much, Wendy, and uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Great. Thank you, uh, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Dudas, please. Thank you very much, Wendy, for that. I, I just had a quick question about staff overtime. <clears throat> um, it sounds, and please correct me if I'm wrong, sounds like some of that resource pressure and cost will come out of the compensation for the vaccine rollout. But are we seeing with other departments that are not necessarily on the forefront of that vaccine rollout, are they putting in overtime? Are they being, um, you know, is there more pressures on them to deliver more? Because we've got the pause on hiring. Uh, Councillor, thanks for the question. Um, we are seeing some overtime with respect to the vaccine rollout. Uh, that's key in terms of our overall plan um, to deliver on that. What we're doing in terms of the um, discretionary hiring pause is it's really at the general manager's discretion. Um, so to avoid things such as overtime, um, they can hire if they feel it's necessary to be able to fill that position and deliver those services. So we're really leaving it at the departmental level to be able to fill those gaps were required. Okay, so we can so just um, knowing that this is going to take quite some time to get through this this year and the vaccine rollout and all the pressures, do you anticipate that we'll see um, a bit of a backlog on the hiring, some additional budget pressures say in 2022, um, any overtime pressures that we can anticipate not for necessarily this budget coming up, but potentially the next one? I have to say that our human resources department is doing an incredible job in terms of their efforts to help us onboard staff, not only for our vaccine efforts, but just for the general day today. Um, with a view to 2022, uh, it, it is very difficult to have that forecast in terms of what the impacts will be. I think as we get closer to pulling the budget together, um, and also as we see ourselves either continue or move out of our response to COVID, that will help us um, in terms of enlighten what that future is going to look like. 
Thank you very much. And I, you know, much to Councillor Councillor Elsh and Terry's point, having those updates throughout will be much appreciated. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, anyone else from Fedco? Councillor McKenney. Oh, sorry, Councillor McKenney. Go ahead. Thank you, uh, thank you, Mayor. Thank you, uh, Wendy and team, for that. Uh, both the surplus deficit report, which was uh, nice and clear, as well as the, the forecast, and appreciate the uh, the early efforts uh, in that. Um, I just had uh, a question around um, the Ottawa Police Services uh, deficit. It had uh, the number was uh, 1.107 million was the was the deficit for 2020. Um, and there was uh, additional pressures you had mentioned later on in the presentation of uh, 3.64 million. So 3.64 million additional pressures, 1.107 million uh, deficit. Does that mean that um, that there, there would have been a difference of 2.53 million? Like, would that have been the the surplus had they not I, I'm just trying to I'm just trying to understand those are our big numbers to be off by in terms of uh, uh, additional pressures and we still have a deficit of 1.07 million. Sure. Um, let's see if I can explain this succinctly for you, Councillor. Uh, their pressures related to COVID were just over 3 million. So that original number that you had um, referenced, and those pressures were funded through the Safe Restart Agreement Fund. So we were able to help them with respect to that. The reason they have a deficit, they actually broke even um, or were within $5,000 of their budget. Uh, they did an incredible job in terms of curbing their expenditures. And um, the deficit of 1.1 that uh, I, I think it was Isabel spoke about in terms of the year end is actually due to the fact that our remissions and rebates from our non-departmental accounts were greater than we had anticipated. We had a large deficit there. And what that means is that a number of multi-year appeals on properties across the city were actually resolved last year. And so it means we paid out a little bit more money in property tax rebates. And every, I'm going to say everybody benefits when we do well and we have surpluses, but when we have deficits, everybody has to um, contribute to that. We allocate those out. So that is the direct reference to the 1.1. 1 .1. Okay. Uh, that, that, thank you for that. Um, and there was also mention just of a 600,000 deficit then. Is that related to the, to, the, to the appeals to the property tax benefits? Or did I, did I misunderstand that? No, it's approximately 1.1. Okay. It yeah, I might. Uh, sorry, it, may, it would have been me. I said it, it was six thousand. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay, that. Apologies. Yeah. I heard six hundred. Okay. No, and I, I said like, six hundred, and I should have said six. Yeah. Okay. No, no worries. Thank you very much. It is very clear, even for me. Thank you. Thanks, Mayor. Thank you, uh, Councillor. Councillor Meehan, please. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Mayor, and thank you, Wendy. Um, I'm just wondering. So we've got uh, 21.8 million uh, going into the tax stabilization reserve fund now uh, from 2020. Can, do you recall what we put into that fund in 2018 or 2019? Uh, my reference or my memory is not that good, Councillor. Um, I believe we had a small surplus last year. Uh, I want to say of approximately $734,000. So we just about broke even last year, um, but I don't have the historical amounts. You say in last year, meaning 2019 because or, or 2020? In 2019, yes. 2019, we did it. it was approximately 700,000. So, yes. so putting 21 million in is really quite the jump. It really has to do with our efforts, Councillor, around yeah. the mitigations that we put in place with yeah. respect to the hiring freeze and the discretionary spending freeze. Mm -hmm. And really that look forward, not knowing that we were going to get help from other levels of government. Mm -hmm. So it just gives us, as I said earlier, that nest egg to help us as we look forward to 2022, if we have to fill some of those gaps during yeah. the budget process. No, I realize that. And that is certainly some comfort. So the tax stabilization reserve fund then is really sitting at about 22 million dollars then right with uh, 700,000 from 2019 
Uh, so I believe it was on slide, I will just check here, uh, slide uh, 11, um, mm -hmm. where we had that projection to year end. So um, our opening balance was approximately 19.4. And then with our surplus um, and some of the ins and the outs from the various budgets, it will end, I think, around uh, 51.5 as our projected opening balance for 2021. 51.5 million will be our tax stabilization reserve fund at end of 2021. Opening for 2021, correct council. Opening for, for 2021. Okay, so the, 20, the 21 million that went into the tax stabilization fund, then there were allocations to transit to everything that went along down. So it was ended up to be, um, what, okay. No, I think I got it. Um, Anything else, Councillor? No, I think that's it. Thank you. Great, thanks, Councillor. Uh, anyone else have any questions uh, to staff? Uh, just a closing comment, uh, again, to thank uh, you, uh, Wendy and Isabel, and your entire team. Uh, I think we're in a relatively good position for 2021 uh, with the support of the other orders of government. And of course, we anxiously look forward to seeing uh, what additional support will be in the federal budget, but I had a chance to thank the Prime Minister when he was touring the Nepean Sportsplex last week for the doubling of the gas tax, because that obviously helps us with a number of capital projects, transit projects that we weren't able to do um, had we not received those dollars. Uh, the biggest uh, challenge we have, of course, financially is uh, the uncertainty of 2022, uh, not knowing uh, what the impact is gonna be to our transit ridership, and our general uh, revenues, both you know rentals and fees and fines and so on. So uh, it's good that we have a very healthy balance in our reserves and our reserves are going up and we still maintain our AAA credit rating. So those are uh, good signs that we're being good, uh, prudent uh, managers of tax dollars. Uh, but again, we have to be um, very cautious as to what 2022 is going to bring because obviously um, COVID uh, and its uh, repercussions will still be with us uh, for some time after we defeat the virus itself. So uh, great work by our Treasury Department. Uh, that I know I think I can speak for all members of Council how grateful we are for your uh, stewardship of our finances. So on the uh, report as presented, carried, at okay. update. Uh, notices of motion. Are there any notices of motion uh, for consideration of subsequent meeting? Uh, any inquiries, Madam Clerk? No, Mr. Mayor. And uh, other business adjournment. Meeting adjourned. Carried. Thank you very much. At our next meeting, a prochaine réunion, c'est le 4 mai 2021. The next meeting is May 4th, 2021. Meeting adjourned. Thank you all. Merci. Thank you, Carol. Very much. That was painless. <laughs> <laughs>